Uh, this seems especially good time to discuss the problem of mental stress. For the last two weeks, the newspapers have been filled with causes for anxiety. Nations that hardly seem big enough to take care of themselves have an irresistent impulse to conquer the world. And uh, now very small countries with nuclear weapons become a hazard to greater powers. So in all of this situation, the average person living under these conditions is almost certain to develop a very good form and an intense form of political stress. Now, political stress is a form of mental stress. Mental because it involves a rational procedure. The uh, individual thinks about what is happening. He adds two and two together and hopes that he gets the four. He's doing all kinds of things in his own life to in, uh, variously insulate him against the pressures of the times. The uh, ugly image of war rises on the horizon and people look back upon a century, almost one complete war. And we realize that we are in very perilous times and that for some reason, difficult to explain, nature does not permit us to forget our own weaknesses even while we are longing to develop our strength. The uh, problem of war and stress brings to us again another phase of life. Stress is a mental process. The individual is rationalizing, but perhaps his rationalizations are irrational. But he is certainly trying to think a way to get out of his problem. He is beginning to look around him in the world and see all kinds of indications of trouble. He is beginning to recognize for the first time perhaps in historic periods that he is definitely involved in something that he is definitely re responsible for. These things are not accidents or incidents. They are not something sent by heaven to, to virtuous people to make them happy. We are convinced more and more that there is a just universe and that if we are in trouble it is because of ourselves. We know this. We recognize it. If we doubt it, we see it around us every day. And yet with all this evidence, there seems to be a kind of paralysis. No one seems to know what to do about anything. The reason being, in nearly every solution that has been offered, there is a strong stratum of selfishness. Self-interest dominates all solutions, and while selfish self-emphasis does dominate, there will be no solution. So we are confronted with a problem that may drift into the next century and may explode at almost any time in the next ten years. A problem in which our own life and the way we've lived it is catching up with us. Uh, we don't like to think of it because many people, how we might point out, are not directly responsible. The individual of 80 or 70 years is not responsible for the fact that the Iridians are looking for uh, new oil fields. We, uh, these people are not responsible for Vietnam or any of those types of problems. They were grown up and going old before these things even happened. Yet they are caught up in the same misery. And it seems as though the stress is being spread over the entire face of the living population of the earth. And everyone, of course, either blames themselves or blames someone else. The tendency is to blame someone else. And in many cases, there is no alternative. As persons, we were not in certain localities and therefore could not be held as personally responsible. But as persons, we were also part of motions. We were, we were giving in to the same causes. We were paying to attribute to the same ideas as those which caused these difficulties. We were very happy to profit from certain consequences of war, but we did not want the war. We were interested in profiting by the various political changes that occur. 
We are in interested in profiting by the new inventions which ensure greater strength in military matters. We are very anxious for the defense, but we do not want to be blamed for the offense. We do not wish to be held responsible, but we would like to be held rewardable if the thing goes through. Well, the pattern is impossible. It simply cannot happen. We have got to face the facts. Now, when we start out in life as small children in a reasonable family, we start in usually with a considerable amount of self-pity. The small child does not understand why it should ever be punished. It does not realize that there's a necessity for discipline. It is simply a little creature with all arms and legs that wants to do what it pleases. And if that, it gets spanked or some mistake that it makes, it doesn't even rationalize the problem, breaks into tears, everyone gets excited, and finally everyone begins to forgives the child who was wrong in the first place. These things are the way it is in a family. Now, the earth is a big house, and this is the family. And in this family that we have here today, who is to say what is justice? Lots of people feel that a, a God who loves us should forgive us, that he should send a Messiah long before the uh, blow falls. The little child in the family who makes a mistake is quite certain that it should be forgiven, and in most cases, in a short time, it is forgiven. There is no grievance held. But everywhere we find the tendency of the individual and the collective to accept punishment as unjust, something that should never have happened to them. It is all right for some other nation to be caught in a difficulty, but we are above these things. And so everybody being above everything, things go the way they do now and we are in great trouble. Now the troubles start upon us and then move in on us. We are today difficult to handle as people. We are emotional, upset, discontented, in, in a state of fear and remorse or an anticipation. The individual is remembering all the little mistakes he made and nations are forgetting or trying to forget some of the big ones they made. But in all cases, the thing that doesn't work is a reminder of something. It is a reminder of a process that was not right or a concept that was not right. And according to the good book, and we have no better authority at the moment, all things that are to come out well must have an honest beginning. We must be moved by right motives. We must follow constructive ideas, and we may, must maintain integrity and honesty in our relations with, with each other. Well, if we look for a civilization that started that way, we'll have a very hard time finding one. For nearly all progress has been one form of uh, warfare, or militarism on top of another. There's been no real definite effort to be kind to someone we don't like or to love to have other people have money that we wish we had. All these things are beyond our understanding and we are assuming, of course, that a God somewhere understands us but doesn't stand, understand the other side of the question. So we are always on the misunderstood side or something. Now, the question arises among a good many Christian people with whom I've been discussing some of these matters, is how can and why does a benevolent deity permit a militarism such as we have today? Well, we can have the same thing when someone says about the neighbor, I wonder why they forbid their small son to go out under the trees at night and smoke pot. They don't allow it, it happens. And they cannot uh, resist the pressure of the child's determination to do what it wills, regardless of consequences. So the parent says, no, you shouldn't. The child says, yes, I will. And when they get too tense, the child walks out and goes where it can smoke in peace. And after a few years, is, is buried with a number of his friends. The, uh, the, the picture is the same, always oh, in the same direction. The struggle against order, law and order and they get against that appetite and ambition. So we have the thing today. The world of the Middle East is just a big family, 
squabbling as families do and always looking for some way to make an advantage out of the squabble. Everyone knows exactly what is happening. They know what is happening. There's no doubt in the world that these people know just as much about the fallacy of war as they we do. But between them and us and the fallacy is the possibility of temporary gain and a larger price for crude oil. So things go on as they were. And the universe as we know it, the human universe, is composed of people who are willing to compromise principles in order to gain profits of some kind for themselves. Now, if this happens in the family, happens in the family, there might be some excitement. They'll say something should be done to punish, punish these juvenile delinquents. Well, nature doesn't come down like Simon Legree with a horsewhip. Uh, nature is constantly compensating the creatures which it has brought forth. Compensation means to be paid in right like, to be paid in the currency of the cause and the deed. And the compensation for a misdeed must necessarily be unpleasant. You cannot do what is wrong and be rewarded for it by what is right. You have to go through the problems of the consequences of your own mistakes. The deity that we understand and believe in is not a visible old gentleman sitting upon the clouds. He's not going to wag his finger at us and tell us we are being bad. But nature will work through its laws and rules which are immutable. And these laws are absolute justice. And absolute justice in the last analysis is the highest form of love. When we do what is right and maintain it, the guardian powers of life reward us. When we voluntarily and intentionally do what is wrong, simply because it is easier or more profitable, the gods of laws and orders and of natures and stars do not reward us with a happy life. So we earn what we, we hope to have. And if we hope to have wealth, we have it, but we have the troubles that come with it. And we will have these troubles as long as we live the way we do now. So we have another crisis. Well, is it going to break out into war? Are there going to be more great struggles? Are we going to have brother against brother? Are we going to have God fighting against God, so to say? Are we going to have more tra tragedies? It's almost impossible to imagine tragedies greater than those we've already had. And in the last century, in the, presumably the most enlightened century of all time, we had the worst wars of all time. We had the greatest destructions that have ever been known on the planet. Why? Not because God didn't love us, not because the universe was against us, not because of the terrible pressures of laws that we can't understand and never will understand, simply rewards for actions we do understand and should do something about. We are getting exactly what we deserve. Now that means, of course, that it looks as though those who don't deserve are getting punished also. And this looks very difficult. It seems also difficult to us when we see a family consisting of a mother, father, and one child, possibly illegitimate, that the child has to go through the suffering that it does not deserve because of the mistakes or indifferences of the parents. And it looks as though good people all over the earth are being wounded and destroyed by bad people. And that this goes on and on and on. But there's a little more to it than shows on the surface. In the nature, there are no elderly gods like Odin with one eye walking the earth with his iron-bound staff. The laws of nature operate through their own structures, structures of law. And the structures are very exact. The structure says definitely, as ye sow, so shall ye reap. Now this sounds very ferocious perhaps, but actually it is absolutely just. And justice is the only basis of security anywhere in nature. If laws are not honest and are not honestly kept, then we have no security. Never will have. But if we do manage gradually to increase in our valid use and understanding of laws, then we are rewarded openly. Things go much better. So we have not an elderly gentleman as the grandfather of the family. We have a universal pattern of realities. Which, have been, which has been given to us so that we may build a life suitable to our own needs. 
Now, among those who are in trouble at the moment, we are reminded again, of course, of the thought in the Bible that then many may fall on the right and left hand, but the just man shall not be moved. So what we have to realize is that somehow the person who doesn't deserve it isn't going to get it. The individual who deserves something better will get something better. And everywhere the way along the way, the div division between the wheat and the chaff is real. That we are not going to be punished for being right. We are going to make, be chastised moderately, usually, for being mistaken. And if that mistake is in, in, impelled by co covetousness or personal destructive ambition, then the penalty gets heavier. But the fact of the matter remains it is that we are rewarded for being right, and uh, the right person is protected. Now, how does the right person get to be protected? Well, being the right person isn't a quick job. Being a right person isn't going to be one who goes to bed on Saturday night uh, a mistaken person and wakes up Sunday morning a right person. It is not going to be like that. Neither of joining a religious orders or reading the scriptures is going to do it. Nothing that we talk about, nothing that we discuss or rationalize will do it. The only way that we can be a right person is to be one. And to be a right person in nature means to keep the rules of the game. Regardless of how we feel about it, if we do what is right, we come under the protection of those powers that guide all things. So always in every generation, in every cycle of life, there are small groups who keep the rules. And those are the small groups which we associate with progress. We associate those small groups with the great religions of the world, with the great philosophies, with the great founders of idealistic sciences, the artists, the musicians, all who have devoted their lives to beauty and truth and wisdom. They, in a way, are the ones who are the salt of the earth. Now, sometimes it happens that some of these people have all these characteristics, these loves of things, and still they're not in honest. Therefore, there's many, there are many forms of uh, achievement which are not rewarded as we should expect them to be. But it's not because of, the, of a fallacy in nature. It is because the achievement was not achieved the way we thought it was, or we did not understand the meaning of the lesson that we were being taught to learn. In this 20th century, we have a lot of lessons. We have lessons on almost every subject dealing with human relationships. We have even lessons, con lessons concerning interstellar space. We have relationships and lessons in the advancement of industries. We have lessons in the advancement of health. All these things are in pattern, and we are placed as, as never before in the presence of the greatest opportunity that a form of life has ever known and the greatest responsibility that accompanies that opportunity. To make most of the opportunity, we must accept the responsibility. And to expect the responsibility means to live in harmony with the laws which protect us against the shortcomings of ourselves and each other. This is therefore part of the problem of stress in a political system on the mental level. The mind is a great excuser, justifier, evader. The mind can talk us into anything and out of anything we wish to allow it to do, and yet nothing that the mind does any more than what the earth does can break a rule without breaking harmony. The mind is to be used in a certain way. The mind is given to us to find the truth. When we use it for any other purpose, we get into trouble. When we use it, you try to use a, a skillful thought as a, an escape from a virtuous action, we are in serious trouble. The mind must be used as it was intended to be used. If the mind is converted to selfishness, it will give us one dynamic empire after another, each one of which will fall in ashes and decay. Every time we use the mind selfishly, we are in more trouble. And yet it seems to us, usually, that, that the mind was given to us for that reason, to make us have trouble. We feel sometimes as though the trouble is part of some tyranny in space, that this mind is being used definitely and definitely to hurt us. 
that we, that we makes us do what is wrong whether we want to or not. All this, of course, is entirely untrue. The mind was never taught to do us any harm. The mind was never taught to do what is wrong. The mind is therefore an instrument of discovery. The mind is like a book to be read. It is like a good strong axe to be used. The mind is something that, that can help us to find reality. But it is not intended for it to become a means of evading the results of our own actions. But when we start to use the th thought to get out of difficulty, we, then we have one kind of mistake of false thinking of another. We have an evasion or an avoidance. We have the mind misused. The moment the mind tries to get us out of a discipline which we should be in, the mind doubles the dose. The moment we do not use the corrective properly, the corrective becomes worse. Now this does not mean that God is not in his heavens or truth does not run the planet. It means that the individual creatures on the planet either keep the rules or break them. It is very, very simple. There is never going to be a time now or any other time when the universal law will compromise itself or be compromised in any way permanently by a, a judgment or a false value set up by one of its creatures. We are not very going to get out of the consequences of our own mistakes unless we outgrow them. We've got to see where we are wrong and why we are wrong. And then when we do that, the prodigal son comes home. And the idea that this is done to hurt us, or that we live in an atheistic universe, there being only two decisions possible, one that God is not aware of what we're doing or may not have exist, or that God is not good, and is consequently is creating systems to toady to him, to make him appear to be a r ruler when he is actually a victim of the conspiracy of mortals. So on this on occasion, where we are facing another one of these emergencies, and there are pros prospects that they may continue on into the next century, then wh what are we doing about it? Are we really doing anything about it? Have we done anything to put God back into science? And I say, when I say God, I don't mean the worship of God. I mean the living of the divine life as it was ordained. There are rules of how to live. Until we keep those rules of how to live, we will suffer and die. Are we really seeking those rules? Or are we seeking ways, as we, as we always have, for evading them, avoiding them, compromising them, or escaping their consequences. Is it true that we are in music or doing the best to, we can to discover the music of the spheres? Are we seeking universal harmony or are we seeking nothing more or less than an excitement to take our minds off of our own mistakes? It's what we call hot music, nothing but part of the fumes of a greater heat coming up from below. That's a very great, great question. <laughs> now also we have to say, what about uh, business? Yes, yeah, business is important. It is important. We have a term for a certain kind of business called monkey business. And that's what we have. We have not even the wisdom of the anthropoid ape or the Pithecanthus erectus. We just have ordinary monkey wisdom. Monkey wisdom which doesn't know what it is doing and never has. Wisdom which attempts to justify the fact that when three foolish men get together and make a law, that law becomes an eternal truth. It doesn't. If everyone on earth voted for the same thing and that thing was wrong, it would still be an untrue vote and it would still be an imaginary solution. Things have to fulfill themselves. The deity that rules all things is infinite wisdom and infinite love. Infinite wisdom shows the way and infinite love shows the patience of the infinite in its constant relationship with its own creations. There is no intention on the nature, part of nature, to be cruel. There is no intention or need for nature to cast great monuments of fire into space. There is no need for wars, for, co for co such compromises as bankruptcies, plagues, earthquakes. These things are not cosmic necessities. They are the consequences of broken rules laws that have been mistakenly interpreted or most of all perhaps have been passed on from generation to generation with children in school and on and up 
simply to make us understand the fact that we are in this world for one purpose only to get as much fun out of it as we can to get as much money out of it as we can and to get out of it before the payments become due <laughs> this is a, a very grave problem so now here we are here we are facing into the problem of mental uh, stress we are going to always be in stress with ourselves, our children, our neighbors and everyone else unless we have a clear understanding of the prop ba proper basis of relationships the easiest way to find the basis of these relationships fortunately or unfortunately depending upon your opinions is through the basis of the great religions and philosophies of the world there's no probability that science will ever give us those solutions because science isn't interested in it a scientist might rise and do it but science won't there must be a scientist who outgrows science so we have to look elsewhere but we have to look somewhere where skills and achievements and advancements lead always to the public good now uh, I saw a book a few days ago that someone handed me to look at written quite a ways back in the 30s somewhere on the development of the uh, computer and television and this type of thing and a book was written by somebody who was pretty insightful and pretty well described exactly the mess that these discoveries have caused that instead of these wonderful discoveries leading to new advancements knowledge and understanding more world peace more equality more jobs uh, more kindness between nations more tolerance between religions instead of these desirable ends all we're getting out of it is more noise and more crime so this means that we are not able to take on even an advancement without abusing it everything that we get now has to be termed in measures of dollars if we can make two dollars grow where one grew before then we consider ourselves a very progressive but in the truth of the matter in the great orders of space it makes no difference whether one dollar grows into two or one into ten the whole pattern is one of integrity and when every name we call it anything that breaks those integrities is in serious trouble and so are we as long as we continue to break them and we are beginning to realize now that television is getting us into trouble we realize that was in hopes would be a great step forward in education has now become a great step forward in the propaganda of crime and degeneracy we know definitely that the, the use of, tele, of television and computerism to help us to advance the common state of man is of very little consideration even where these are public instruments they are exploited for the benefit of private business so all this shows the way a thing is going and it also shows why at this particular moment each individual has a job on his hands he's got to convert himself to the kind of world he lives in know why he's in it and know how to get out of it now the getting out of this world doesn't mean suicide it doesn't mean becoming a hopeless addict to uh, various drugs or bad habits it means a solution we are in a mess we are definitely voting for a mess whenever a vote comes up whenever we buy something we are buying a mess whenever we plan a career we are planning to fit into the mess and our retirement is what we hope to be will be a retirement out of the mess but actually into private or public facilities which will charge us thoroughly to take care of our closing years everywhere we go the same problems are no? you can look around you may find occasionally will find occasionally someone who will, is understanding of these things but for the great majority it's a case of setting down and using the mind to solve the problems of the of daily living it is up to the mind to give us the answers we have to have and one of the answers that we forget first of all when we think it that way is the answer of integrity the first thing we've got to find out is what is the honesty of the matter then we have to say to ourselves and prove it by careful thought and, re and research that the good man does not punish is not punished for the sins of the evil ones 
There is no way that, uh, that evil can contaminate us unless we are subject to contamination because of weakness in our own natures. If we are basically selfish, there will be always something that can uh, create a, a mood of selfishness. If, if we are constantly bewildering in a world of antagonisms, of jealousies, and of comp competition, as long as these factors are strong in our own minds, we will have these problems. That is why in the old days uh, wisdom was separated widely from wealth. In Greece and Egypt and India and those ancient countries, wealth was not a distinction. Some were born wealthy, and some gained it, and some won it by war, but it was not essentially an achievement. War was one way of controlling the bodies of things, but wisdom was the way of unfolding the inner life of things the bestowal of integrities upon the patterns of living. <coughs> Therefore, we were very definitely involved in the problem of the gaining freedom from the stress of our own addictions. The individual who has been smoking heavily of cigarettes for 25 years has a trouble, trouble breaking away. He gets headaches, he gets sick, he takes the cure, he breaks down, he comes back to smoke again, he gets another refine and keeps on going until either he quits or whether it's or the throat cancer takes him out. Now this is the same way with civilization. We have war after war, revolution after revolution. Great industrial institutions rise and fall, the banking system builds tremendously and then collapses. Everything we do that is purely material and self-centered ends in trouble. There is no way of making mistakes permanent and valuable. They are always impermanent and worthless. So we come to the point where we have to try to find out what to do about them. And one of the things we have to do about them is go right back to our own childhood. We will assume that nature was a kindly parent, wiser and more loving than any of us. Nature gave us all a chance to come into this world. The moment we get out of that unseen world, we move from the invisible to the invisible and become a part of the life of physical embodied creatures. The child that is an un the unborn is a strange and wonderful thing. The moment it is born into this world, it is a little crying creature waiting for us to take care of it and practically giving us the greatest affection, love and vitality that we can ever know. But this coming into embodiment is integrity coming into life. It is the reality of things impressing themselves upon living creatures. If a virtue becomes embodied, the person who has it is called virtuous. And this virtue is not just simply a mental attitude. It is not a, a compensation for being unselfish when you really want to be rich. Not at all. It is the fact that you have outgrown a fallacy. You have outgrown something that was ultimately going to kill you and have chosen rather that which would ultimately bring you to eternal life. And nature, that is nature's love. Nature's love is to see you grow. And your idea for most part in the material world is to resist growth in every way possible because it interferes with immediate profit or social standing. Yet this social standing and this profit vanishes away and it becomes part of a great lost world which can never be restored. We are gradually reaching the point now where a decision is, inevi is inevitable. We are going to have to decide what constitutes a good life. That we can use almost any invention that we have for the benefit of all concerned if we take selfishness and self-interest out of it. We can grow beautifully in all the ways that we ought to grow if we stop thinking of growth merely as wealth. The individual who believes that growth is getting into a higher bracket of public office is a mistaken person. He is mistaken the reason for himself. That doesn't mean he couldn't have a higher office, but we'd have to be elected for a different motive, for a different reason. He would be elected because of what he could give and not for what he could get. And those who put him in would be able to know that they were performing a personally virtuous act rather than merely advancing their own paycheck. So everywhere along, nature in its kindness 
It gives us the wisdom and love that belongs to its own nature. The, the world we live in is a world that is filled with divine love. Love for the littlest thing that exists. Love for the moat and the sunbeam. Love, love for all the little creatures of nature. All the things that we are destroying with the abuse of the ecological situations. The world we live in was primarily a world of friendship, of getting along together. The lion and the lamb sitting down together in solving the problems of life. This world was a garden until we subdivided it and began to think of it in terms of profit by the acre. The moment we became mercenary, the garden faded away. And we had continents with various colored backgrounds on, on maps. And we had these map countries always fighting each other. There was never can be and never will be anyone who can own the earth or control it or dominate it. It belongs to the great system of worlds to which we all belong. It is our step upward into something else. If we try to destroy it, we destroy the very stairs upon which we have to climb. So it's gradually we're going to have to get over this. It has now been estimated, and one paper noticed long ago, that one third world war mother, one of these comes and becomes a, a, a victim of migration, one in three generations can contribute over 400 new members to the population. In other words, in a, gradually, population is increasing at its incredible rate, a rate which will mean that in a very few years there will be no space for them. It can't be. And someone says, well, it's pretty obvious that God made a mistake on that one. No. Man made the mistake. God set this thing up so that every phase of it is perfectly in, harm in harmony and perfectly proper. And the way it was developed and established in the first place, it could go on for a million years without any definite danger to anything that inhabits it. But in a few thousand years, we have made it a madhouse and a slaughterhouse. And there's where the thinking has to change. So, we come now to our present day. And we come to consider the situations that we are going to face when we begin to think in terms of the effect of stress upon mind. Stress upon mind means gradually discouragement, fear, anxiety. It begins to doubt the will and goodness of providence. Doubt the kindness of your own friends. Doubt the integrity of your own family. Little by little, stress creates evil. If they're not there, it will be suspected. If it is there, it will be exaggerated. And little by little, the planet will become a mass of isolated individuals, each frightened of all others. Every animal afraid that it will be eaten for meat. Every plant that will be ground up to something. Every elephant that will be killed for ivory. And every human being will be worked to death to the advancement of the fortunes of a few. All these things are coming unless somebody does something about it. And the place to where it should be done is where it should began in the first place, in the Garden of Eden. It should have been there. It should be right now in the lives and hopes and dreams of moderate-minded people who still believe in something worthwhile and are still willing to live a, a doctrine or a religion that inspires without a conspiracy. We need this and we get it. And right now it's coming. Everywhere groups are coming into existence. Religions are coming to be reborn that were ignored for years. The books are being written now that would not be allowed on a press 25 years ago. Everywhere man is searching for something. And he is searching, usually, up now, in the mysterious. He is searching somewhere in the codes of yoga, or Vedanta, or Kabbalah, or something. Mysticism. All these types of things. Because materialism has failed utterly. Now those who are still struggling desperately to maintain materialism are becoming fewer all the time and are dying off one by one. The, uh, the casualty rate 
among prominent agnostics and atheists has been very heavy in the last 25 years. They're just disappearing. They cannot survive because they contribute nothing except more pain to the suffering. They don't give anything of themselves that is worth anything. Nothing but a bitter uh, uh, expose of their own corruption. So today they have more and more coming in search of a better way of life. <laughs> and in this search they are going more and more to the great systems of religion and ethics. They are not, not so interested now in sectarianism. They are interested in the experience of a divine plan in which all things rest in the integrity of an eternal power. <coughs> rest in the integrity of, of an absolute truth. And also that the, this universe is so geared, so constructed and so put together that in proper care it can go forever. It can go on to long forms of life that don't even exist here now. It can go on into the infinite as a step in the development of a great unfolding integrity. If we, if we abuse it, we destroy it and ourselves with it. But when I say destroy, I don't mean that the individual can actually eliminate himself. The only thing he can destroy is the evil self in himself. And the evil self, if it largely predominates him, doesn't leave much when it's taken away. It doesn't leave a happy, healthy creature. It leaves something frightened to death because of its own infirmities and mistakes. So the idealist has to start from the ground and build up again. To build into the values he knows are right. And by building into them, sharing in them. So every sincere, simple person who wants to be on the right track and wants to get where he should get has to begin to think of the real values of life. And he will have to work with the stress inside himself because this stress is going to determine much. Stress is going to be the fight between Joe, the man looking for a fortune, and Joe, the man looking for love and respect. He's going to find him without struggling against the very forces he, that long ago he believed to be realities. We're going to find him more and more interested in simple, common, everyday kindnesses. We find that there's a, a love that tells more than wisdom can ever tell. That in working together with humanity for the advancement of the common good, we find the real job for which we were intended. The individual who works for himself alone is a pretty lonesome character. But the individual who works with others and with himself to the service of others beyond his own need, well, they're a pretty wise married person. So we think now more and more of uh, this problem of tension as the struggle of the individual against the pressures of a corrupted, neurotic society. We see it becoming worse all the time. We see the school systems collapsing. We see the utilities failing. We see nations who are perfectly willing to go to war because they want a few cents on oil. We find countries breaking off into fragments so small that they can't politically exist. Everything done according to tremendous urges of selfishness and a few despots who determ are determined to exploit the, the errors of the common people. So this proposition we see. But what can we do about it? Well, we can do one thing. And if enough people can do that, we will be going somewhere. The one thing is the individual can convert himself. He can find in his own experience a source for the realization of the victory of good over evil, of eternity over time, and of spirit over matter. He can experience every day that he lives in an unfolding universe, which has always been there, but he didn't see until he opened his own eyes. No one else can open his eyes for him. All the schools in the world can't open them because their eyes are being opened only by dedication, by a desperate statement of conviction, by a determination to achieve to a higher degree of individual integrity. The individual who takes a quiet obligation in his own heart and in his own mind and keeps that obligation is already an immortal creature. 
He is consciously immortal. He was always immortal, but he didn't know it. But when he keeps the rules, he becomes aware of his own conscious immortality. And in so doing, lays the program for ages of to come, of growth, unfoldment, and dedication. When selfishness dies, the soul is released. The moment gavarous and conflict and chicanery are overcome, the inner life of the individual can express itself. The inner life of man is essentially a soul power, a power that contains within itself the infinite blessing of deity and the infinite strength to accomplish all that is necessary for the perfection and revelation of itself. There is nothing in the lacking in the universe. Deity has not bestowed its preciousness upon one sect, upon one group, one race, or one family. It has given of itself to one who is true, anyone, slave or superior, who is dedicated to truth, dwells in the spirit of wisdom and in peace with the inner life. This peace with the inner life is the end of stress. It is the only end that stress can come to. There are no ways that it can be anything else except peace. And peace is not stagnation. It is the, a new experience of what is important and what counts. Peace is a sudden realization that that which inwardly brings joy to the soul it brings fulfillment to the life. Peace is therefore a gentleness with space, a part being a part of a great universal purpose, and that in that great purpose there is room for all to grow and all happiness to be achieved. This purpose is not responsible for war, yet man is responsible for war. We are all responsible for the sins we suffer from, and the only remedy is to cure them in ourselves. And the only way now, apparently, that the infinite power has found a way to cure us is to make these mistakes, mistakes so terrible that we can't endure them. That doesn't mean that the powers that be make them terrible to destroy us, but it makes, us, makes them terrible to awaken us to the need that is within our own consciousness. Man has a purpose that is beyond the boundaries of time and space as we know it. Man has a purpose somewhere out there into the infinite world of creation and of good. It is part of a great redeeming life that moves through space and time to the fulfillment of its own purpose. And somewhere beyond the stars and beyond the light and beyond the mysteries of time and space is a mysterious purpose. A purpose which we are so far ahead of us that we don't know what it is. But towards which we work. And every step in the right direction is a release from limitation and a participation in the next step of this great revelation. Every, mis every backsliding is a mistake binding us back again to a world that has done nothing but, to hurt, but hurt us from the beginning of time. Sin is therefore the individual theory, feeling incapable of growth. Sin is to assume that growth is evil, that, that progress is wrong, and that physical things which hurt each other are right. This is not possible. The final thing, that peace is right, means that we must find peace. And the, and the individual, to find peace, must discover it in the only place where, as a person, he can discover it. And that is in the quietude of his own soul. Therefore, one nice little thing that everyone can do is have a new friendship. A friendship with his own soul that he can sit down quietly of occasion and have little chats with this power within himself. A power which wants him to overlook the shortcomings of his relatives and his friends, get over all the evil thoughts he has about anything, and realize, finally, that all things are fulfilling the law of their own purpose, and that the best he can do is to discover the beauty of that purpose and that law, live according to it, and if opportunity arise, share it with someone else. There is no reason why this journey through life should just be one war after another. There may be wars and rumors of war, but the just person sees through them, knows what they are, and realizes that out of this wanderings in the, window, in the wilderness, the human soul will come ultimately and finally to the promised land, which is its proper home. When we realize that, we know exactly why we're here. And while we know why we're here, we also have the peace of mind 
we don't worry anymore what Iraq does to Iran these things will be for them to decide and they will be rewarded or punished according to the measure of their integrity the purpose that we have is to remember that we mustn't think of these things in terms of other people getting, getting away with being bad while we have to suffer for being good this is not it no one ever suffered from being good they, uh, they suffer from a false sense of goodness they fall usually from a goodness which is frustrated selfishness and while that remains that, that isn't the answer but there's no reason why those who have understanding and insight cannot live a good and enlightened life in the very world we're in and that in this case that will reduce tension and reduce stress stress is a sense of, dis of discontent of disconcertion despite as we and stress as we know it is, is a sense of unfairness we don't feel stress about the punishment for crime if it is legitimate but when the innocent are punished for the guilty then we feel stress we feel remorse we think there's something wrong in the plan of things but what we have not let learned is that no one yet has been punished for being right many are punished trying to be right many have had to go to, pay, to give up a great many things that other people believe necessary in order to gain right but I've known several who having given away all of this world's goods have retired into the simple life of serving others in some gentle capacity I know a man back east who after the Jewish depression of 1929 lost practically all of a vast fortune including the family fortune he could have started over again he could have been a millionaire again but he didn't he took the crumbling remains of what was left very little and went out and went into an African Indian reservation and settled down there to help these people to uh, gain their proper rights and liberties and get proper schooling and medical attention he gave a lifetime to this purpose he was never paid anything he never was regained any of his finances but he died happy he discovered that he had found a reason for being alive and wealth as a reason for being alive is a damn failure no matter how you figure it it is nothing unless it is used for some great purpose the legitimacy of wealth is its dedication to the needs of humanity so everywhere peace security integrity will remove stress if we stop allowing selfishness and competition to constantly interfere there is nothing that the individual has in this world that he's going to take with him but himself therefore he might as well get rid of some of it here keep what he needs and start living a better life not trying to compete for great wealth the more wealth he competes for the worse his governments are going to be the more lands he takes the more lands will be taken from him the bigger the banks the quicker they will fail all these things in excess are detriments to themselves living quietly peacefully respectfully having that which is necessary to live with dignity but with simplicity and to devote the mind and heart largely to the advance of wisdom and understanding and to share the joys of life with those we love and with those who understand us to work together for a common good this is the proper duty and the proper labor of the human being Thank you.